save. Okay. Hi, my name is Joshua Jensen. I am a professional engineer and I own my own firm, Sunflower Structural Engineering. And I do quite a bit of uh, residential work. And um, I get a lot of questions about different things. And one of the things that other engineers are commonly confused by or, or ask about is, um, including myself, is how to analyze a steel beam that is top loaded by a floor system like floor joists and supported by uh, and is continuous over support columns and it's kind of a, a tricky situation because the floor joists provide lateral restraint to the top flange of the beam but the bottom flange of the beam is completely unbraced and over interior supports you have a negative bending moment that causes compression in the bottom flange and so the question becomes is is this beam completely braced can i use the plastic moment for for the strength of this beam or how do i actually cal calculate the lateral torsional buckling strength of this beam well um, I put together a little design example that I just wanted to share with you guys to kind of shed, shed some light on this topic. And so um, the assumptions and the assumptions that were made in this uh, example, design example, were joists provide lateral restraint to the top flange of the beam. The joists do not provide rotational restraint to the top flange, so the beam is allowed to to twist and spin along its own axis freely. There's no torsional restraint there. Restoring moment from the tipping effect is ignored. So as the beam uh, twists and the load position on the beam changes, we're going to ignore that effect. Um, we're going to just assume that the load main, remains centered on, uh, along the, uh, the web of the steel beam. The vertical load remains centered along the web. Column provides torsional restraint to the beam at the support. So this pipe column right here, we're going to assume that it provides torsional restraint to that beam. And that's a, most of the time, that's a, that's an okay assumption to make, but not all the time. And we're going to go over why that is. Column does not carry a torque about its own axis. So this column here um, is allowed to spin freely. It can't carry a torque from the floor slab to the beam. We have a uniformly distributed load. I know this picture isn't exactly, doesn't exactly represent a uniformly distributed load because these floor joists over here are shorter than they are um, on this side of this span, but that's okay. And then we're going to assume torsional brace at the supports. Most of the time you've got beam pockets at the supports and they will effectively torsionally brace the beam. Here's another example of a continuous steel beam supporting a floor system with an interior support. So AIS 360, AISC 360-10 is what I'll be using for this desi design example. If you go look in the commentary, the chapter F commentary, you'll find a reference to some research by Yura and Helwig. And uh, you can, if you look up that, the, that information, that Yura and Helwig put together. Um, they came up with this bending coefficient equation for a beam that is uh, gravity loaded and continuously braced along the top flange. And so in, in, in their um, research and the way they handle things, the unbraced length of the beam is considered to be between points of rotational restraint so in our so for us that would be between support points essentially would be L sub B, and um, so they provide this equation here of your bending coefficient C sub B, three minus two thirds M one over M zero minus eight thirds times M sub C L over M zero plus M one. So M one and M0, what those are going to be, 
those are going to be um, the moments at the ends of the span. So this here shows you what those represent. So MCL is moment at the center line, basically, or at the center of the span length. So that's the moment at the center of the span length. And then M0 is the moment at the end that causes the greatest compression in the bottom flange. And then M1 is the moment at the other end. So for this example up here, this beam here, um, M0 is going to be over this interior support. And MCL is going to be here. And then M1 is going to be at this at these outer supports, which is going to be zero. So for us, this, this here is going to be zero. MCL is going to be WL squared over 16 approximately. And M0 is going to be WL squared over 8. So um, that's, that's kind of how this equation works. And so you also need to, when you use this equation, you also need to look at the signs of the moments and make sure you put in the correct signs. Okay, so here's our design example. Determine the maximum allowable uniformly distributed load of a W10 by 12 beam supporting floor joists on the top flange. Use the C sub B factor and reference AISC 360-10 commentary equation C-F1-5. So I have two equal spans of 20 feet each. We're going to assume flexural continuity over the interior support. We're going to assume the pinned in con conditions at each outer support. We're going to assume it's continuously braced along the top flange by the joists. We're going to assume torsional bracing at all the supports, so it's restrained from rotating at all its supports. And then we're going to assume the bottom flange is completely unbraced um, between supports. We're going to ignore the tipping effect or the restoring moment from eccentric loading. And we're going to say our yield strength is 50 KSI and our modulus elasticity is 29,000 KSI. So we can start by solving for our bending coefficient. That equation we just talked about um, in, the, in the chapter F commentary from Ura and Helwig. And here's that equation. So um, M1 for us is 0. M0 is negative WL squared over 8. And moment at the center line, MCL is WL squared over 16. So we plug those in. And it comes out like this to where C sub B is equal to 4 and 1 third. Okay, so we have our C sub B. So now we can go ahead and calculate the elastic lateral torsional buckling stress, F sub C R, or F critical, using equation F2-4. So here's our C sub B in that equation. And then everything else is just the normal um, critical stress that you'll see, that you'll find for uh, calculating the critical stress for LTB. So at this point, we're just doing a nor this is a normal step in in designing a beam um, although our C sub B is pretty dang high much higher than usual so you you track down all your variables for a W10 by 12 and you plug and chug and you come out with 38.45 KSI So then, now that we have the critical stress, now we can go ahead and calculate the nominal flexural strength. Uh, first, we have to keep in mind that the plastic that our nominal flexural strength cannot exceed the plastic strength of the beam. So first, we're going to go ahead and calculate the plastic strength, which is the plastic section modulus times the yield strength. And then we're going to calculate the nominal flexural strength by taking our section modulus times our critical stress. Our section modulus is 10.9 inches cubed. And we're going to multiply that by the critical stress we just got, which is 38.45. And we come out with 419.1 kip inches. Uh, the plastic moment actually comes out to be 630 kip inches. So we're well below that. So um, we're fine there. And then the last step 
is going to be to calculate the maximum allowable uniformly distributed load. So we'll take, uh, we'll rearrange the W L squared over 8 equation and we'll solve for W and we'll throw in a fee factor of 0.9 for L or F D. So we got 0.9 times the moment we just calculated times 8 divided by the span length squared. So we come out with 0 0.052 kips per inch, multiply that by 12, and you get 0 0.627 kips per foot, or 627 pounds per foot along the length of the beam is what the uh, LRFD strength, design strength would be. So, <clears throat> I don't know if you're like me, but when I get into using these equations, um, they're in the code, so I have pretty good faith in them. But um, I like to, to validate them on my own and try to understand them on my own. And for me, the easiest way to do that is to put together a FEA model and see if I can um, if I can put together a model that has some resemblance to these equations and if I if my FBA model tells me the same thing that those equations tell me then I start to build more confidence so what I did was I put together an FEA model um, for this for this beam and um, looked at it at several different span lengths one at 12 and a half feet one at 15 feet one at 17 and a half feet one at 20 feet then I did 22 and a half feet, 25 feet. Then I did 30 and 40 feet. Once I got out past 25 feet, the, the buckling stress was completely elastic. And so I didn't think I needed to do any, I didn't think I needed to do one at 35 or 32 and a half. Um, I did a closer spacing for my checks of, uh, at these lower unbraced links because I wanted to see what kind of effect if there was any uh, inelastic effects I guess I should say so so what you're looking at here is the blue line is what you would calculate by hand using those equations that we just used so just a second ago we did an example at 20 feet and we came out with a moment of 419 kip inches so you can see 400 right there if we go to 20 feet we come up, we hit the blue line, we go over, we're going to be at, a, at 419 uh, kip inches. So the red, these red diamonds, those were the maximum um, moments that the beam was able to carry in a nonlinear stability analysis. So uh, I plotted those against each other to see how close they were, if there was general general agreement in the behavior. And I was also curious about the effects of inelasticity, which didn't um, appear to be as dramatic as what I thought they would be. And then this orange line here is, is at 630. That is the plastic um, moment of the meme. So uh, we cannot exceed that, that value. So this blue line where it goes up above the plastic moment, uh, that's, uh, you know, obviously you would ignore that strength and you would take it back down to the plastic strength. Um, so as I said, the, the, the analysis, the FEA analysis was materially and geometrically nonlinear with imperfections imperfections included, uh, conducted for various span lengths using commercially available FEA software. The nominal flexural strengths are plotted on the chart below in the red diamonds. There is good agreement between the FEA and the equations in the AIC. It does appear that the FEA analysis produced lower nominal flexural strengths when the buckling stress was near the yield stress. This may be due to partial yielding, yielding of the beam at the onset of buckling, possibly, or it could just be uh, that the C sub B equation um, doesn't perfectly match my situation, or maybe there's something in my model that uh, 
that doesn't perfectly line up with the way the C sub B equation that you're in Helwig uh, defined. Maybe there's something different that I didn't account for, which I'm sure there is. But this agreement's pretty, I mean, for me, that's for design purposes, that gives me some confidence. Um, so imperfections were applied in the model. So the imperfection I applied was the span length divided by a thousand. So for the 20 foot model, um, I did 20 feet. You convert that to inches, you get 240 inches, divide that by a thousand, and then you come out with a quarter inch of, of, uh, of, of, uh, bow, basically bow in your flanges out, out of, uh, out of straightness, I guess you could say. So how I applied the imperfection was I, I did a linear buckling analysis on the beam to get mode shapes for linear buckling eigenvalue analysis. So, and then what I did was I took the, that shape and, 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 um, applied that quarter inch value to it, to the maximum. So here's the mode shape. The red portions of the beam show where the maximum displacement was. So in my model, in the 20 foot model, the displacement at these points would have been a quarter inch. And so what you can see is kind of going on here is here's the interior support and the end supports are out here. So on one span, the bottom flange is kicking out um, to the left and then to the adjacent span, the bottom, bottom flange is kicking out or buckling to the right. So it's got kind of got this re reverse curvature thing going on here. Um, and so this was the imperfection that I applied to all the models. So then the other thing you have to think about is residual stresses. Um, I tried to simulate residual stresses by reducing the compressive yield strength of the plate elements in the outer quarter of the beam flanges. Um, so I, I, the outer quarter of the beam flanges, I assume, assumed would have about 30% of uh, yield strength, residual stress. So I kind of averaged it out and I said, okay, um, let me assume that the outer quarter of the beam flanges have a effective yield strength for stiffness purposes, I guess you could say a 42 and a half KSI. And then, um, the ten tensile yield strengths would go up the same amount that the compressive went down. And then for the inner half of the, of the flanges, so the inner core of the flange, I made the compressive yield strength higher and I made the tensile yield strength lower. So I did the reverse. And by doing this, I kind of preserved the plastic moment strength of the beam. So if you do the areas times the yield strengths, it kind of all balances out. Um, but yet at the same time, because you're lowering, lowering the compressive yield strength in the flange tips, it should give you some reduction in stiffness that should uh, help simulate the actual effect of residual stresses on a, on a real beam. And then for the web, I didn't change anything. I kept it at 50 KSI compressive yield strength, 50 KSI tensile yield strength. So that's, that's how, um, how I came up with this chart here. So that, I hope that inspires a little bit of confidence. Um, a, a few other things I wanted to discuss is, uh, the tipping effect also known as the restoring moment. So if you've got like a slab or even, even wood floor joists, I guess, you know, as your beam twists, you know, um, because we assume, we assume that the beam did not provide rotational restraint. It just provided lateral restraint. So we're free to twist. All these calculations we just did, we're assuming it's free to twist. So what can happen is, is the actual position of the load can change to a more favorable position as the beam twists. So if the beam's wanting to twist counterclockwise, like in this example, well, now the the, the flange here wants wants to carry the load from the joist and so now your 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 load position moves from the center line of the web to the outer point on the flange so now you got this restoring torque well 
Um, that doesn't always work because sometimes if your top flange um, is relatively thin and your restoring load is relatively high, you can just distort the section and the flanges can bend or the web can bend. And so um, this doesn't always actually help you. You have The, the section has to be capable of, of uh, resisting these forces without deformation. Um, so during buckling, the beam tends to twist. This can lead to the load being applied eccentrically in a stabilizing manner. It is conservative to ignore this effect. It can be accounted for by applying a rotational spring support along the length of the beam. The same effect can be seen at the supports. Okay, so if these beams are supported at, at the bottom and then at the support they want to rotate, well, then the location of the support force can, can move as well and provide a restoring torque. Um, if the beam is loaded at the top flange and the, and the joists do not provide lateral restraint, the load can have a destabilizing effect. Careful consideration should be given to the load support position and the possibility of a destabilizing effect. So if you have a support load underneath this beam, you know, pushing up on it, helping it stay up, and, but yet that support is free to drift left or right here, well, now you're actually going to move that load point to a destabilizing position and you're going to actually apply more torque to this beam and you're going to cause it to fail. So that's why you really, really need lateral uh, or uh, rotational or torsional restraint at your supports. If you don't have torsional restraint at your supports, then these beams will tend to want to just kind of roll over on themselves. Um, so it has a destabilizing effect. So it can go both ways. You can have a, a stabilizing effect or a destabilizing effect. You just have to really consider your exact situation, what your connections look like and all that. Um, the other thing I want to talk about was torsional, the torsional brace at the interior support. So if we go back to our picture of the, kind of the situation that we're looking at here. So this, this is a pipe right here, pipe column, schedule 40 pipe supporting a steel beam. So in our design example, we assume that this beam was, was, was torsionally restrained here. So it can't twist here. The section's not allowed to twist over that support. Well, some people may look at that and say, wait a minute, is that true? Is it, is a really torsional re restraint provided by this column? Well, um, in many cases, yes, that is true. It is true that this column here can actually provide sufficient stiffness and strength to, to torsionally brace this beam. And that's because if there is any, if there's fixity at this connection here between this pipe column and the beam, imagine if this beam wants to twist, then this column will want to kick out left or right as the beam twists, but this column is not going to kick out left or right because it's typically either embedded in the concrete floor slab or it's bolted to the concrete floor slab. So it can kind of stabilize this beam. Well, <clears throat> most of the time that's going to be okay, but sometimes um, this connection won't be adequate to provide fixity or the beam flanges will be too thin and the beam flanges can just locally bend and twist and you can get distortion of the section. Um, or the other thing that can happen is the web of the beam can actually uh, cripple right here and fail. So um, that's a whole nother thing to get into on, on what constitute what can actually constitute a torsional brace. But for the most part, um, if you calculate your web crippling strength and your web crippling strength is okay, and you've got a bolted connection here, with a, with a cap plate over that column, for the most part, um, this is going to be sufficient to provide torsional restraint. But you should do your own investigation. You should look at your, your own construction details and your own situation and make sure you're okay there. Because if that column does not provide torsional restraint, then the uh, design example that we just went over on how to calculate the bending strength of these beams uh, is completely invalid and the actual flexural strength of the beam 
decreases tremendously, tr- tremendously. If, if, that, if that's just a, a knife edge support and it doesn't provide torsional restraint, tremendously decreases the strength. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy how much that torsional brace will strengthen the entire beam. Um, local, okay, so localized bending of the bottom flange and buckling of the beam web over the column support can drastically reduce the load carrying capacity of the beam. Localized bending of the beam bottom flange reduces the effectness, effectiveness of the torsional restraint provided by the column. Buckling of the beam web can interact with lateral bucking, buckling of the bottom flange. So you got to really look at your, um, your web uh, crippling. Um, and, and if you're close to your web crippling limit, you may just go ahead and throw on web stiffeners. Web stiffeners over the column support may be required for the torsional bracing of the beam and or to prevent web crippling. One, one last thing is a weak axis flexural restraint at the support. So near the buckling load, rotation of the beam about its weak axis occurs directly over the interior support. If a pipe column is used to support the beam, the pipe column may provide restraint to the beam for rotation about its weak axis. The pipe column can carry a torque along its length and into its base plate. If the column cap plate and base plate have torsional fixity, then this effect can be significant. This effect can be conservatively neglected for simplicity of the analysis, this can also be thought of as warping restraint provided to the beam bottom flange at the support. So if this is your, your beam and you're looking at it from the top and this is the buckled mode, and just in, just envision that this right here is the bottom flange of the beam where one side of the, uh, on one span, the, the bottom flange of the beam wants to buckle to the right, and then the adjacent span, the bottom flange wants to buckle to the left, and then this black circle right here. Imagine that's the pipe column. So the bottom flange overall takes on this double curvature kind of S shape. So what happens is, is over the column support, there's actually a, a, a lot of rotation that happens um, in the beam about its own weak axis or the bottom flange, I guess you could say. And, and so if that column is torsionally fixed to the beam, it will try to twist the column. And if the column is torsionally fixed to the slab or the footing with two, three, four bolts, then, then that'll carry a torque into those bolts and into that slab which will tend to stabilize this whole system. It's almost like if you think of like a if you think of like a column that's in compression in a building and it's buckling in double curvature, but you have a beam framing into the side of it and that beam is f- fixed to the column, then it provides some some uh, rotational rigidity to the to the joint there. That's kind of what this pipe column will do is it provide ro- some rotational rigidity to that the joint there and it'll want to prevent this bottom flange from buckling outwards uh, like it does because that's the buckling mode for, for what we're looking at here is the bottom flange wants to buckle out. So um, this is something that's in in real life is going to is going to strengthen the system but as far as the analysis goes Um, you may just want to ignore that and and just, uh, put it in your back pocket and say, and and tell yourself, Hey, I've got some extra strength in my system that I'm not even accounting for. So that's it. That's been my little presentation on the flexural strength of steel beams supporting eye joists on the top flange. Um, thanks for checking this out and, um, If you got any comments or questions, just let me know. I'd be happy to discuss it with you. Thanks a lot.